Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Professional Education Quickenar. Uh, my name is Matt McDonough. I am with the ESRD NCC. And on behalf of the NCC, I want to welcome you to our COVID-19 provider-focused event. And today's event is Dialysis Provision and COVID-19. Now, before we continue to our next slide, I do want to let you know that this event is being recorded, and our slides and our recording are typically published within three business days, although we do try to get a little bit quicker uh, than that. So um, we'll move through this quickly because I know we want to get to our speakers. Uh, this call, uh, we're going to talk about what this call is about, and then we'll introduce our two speakers, um, Liz and Suzanne from um, Northwest Kidney Centers. And then at the end of today's event, as time allows, uh, we will uh, answer any questions from our Q&A panel, which is available in the WebEx menu, or the chat panel, which you should see on your screen. Uh, so feel free at any time to submit your questions to our speakers or to us today, and we'll get to as many as we can as time allows. Um, this call, if you've been on these before, it's an opportunity for us to hear from stakeholders in the ESR community who are actively in their practices adapting to COVID-19 and everything that comes along with it. And hopefully you'll get some real world strategies that you can put to use in your facility or practice or wherever you are uh, to help you cope and adapt uh, to COVID-19 as well. And these are weekly calls and we do try to vary the topic each week, uh, reflecting something that is pertinent and important to the community. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Suzanne Watnick. She's the Chief Medical Officer at Northwest Kidney Centers. And along with her, uh, I heard Liz McNamara is with us as well. Um, and she is the Vice President of Patient Care Services and the Chief Nurf Nursing Officer as well at Northwest Kidney Centers. Um, Suzanne and Liz, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, your patience and getting connected. And I will turn this over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you and um, really look forward to sharing our stories. Uh, we know that this has been an incredible challenge for the entire community and one of the remarkable things, despite um, the, ch the extreme challenges with the pandemic, is the how much the community has worked together. Um, so we would love to just let you know that we're now going on week eight here. Correct. Uh, um, and Liz and I, um, we're naming ourselves a dynamic duo, mm -hmm. um, I suppose. And um, we, we really, um, this is an evolving process. We want to start out by telling all of you. Uh, but nonetheless, we're trying, we really did try to start with some basic guiding principles. And so I'll ask for you to advance to the next slide. And as you're advancing to the next slide, uh, just wanted to let you know out there that as we found out um, that the first reported death um, here in the United States um, was one of our patients, uh, we received this phone call, as we always receive these types of phone calls at 9 o'clock on a, on a Friday evening, um, after we suspended our disbelief, um, we had the next day in that facility where we were not serving patients, so we immediately, you know, um, stood up our emergency operating center cleaned the facility, started getting new policies and procedures intact right away, and Liz and I spoke very, um, very frequently and uh, very passionately about how to do this appropriately for our patients. And so she and I, as well as the lead clinical director for the area, showed up at 0445 on Sunday morning, because in that facility we actually dialyze on Sundays, um, to greet the patients and let them know firsthand from us rather than hearing from the media what had happened and what we were doing to protect them. And so our two basic guiding principles that we started with um, were first of all, first and foremost, were to ensure that we were going to provide dialysis to our patients. Not only we were going to do it, but we felt we had an obligation to do that. And then second of all, we really wanted to do our best to lean into the science that we knew. And this has really been an evolving process but um, the best we know at this point is that this is a respiratory disease primarily transmitted by droplets. And so with that, that is how we try to stand up what our process was to both screen patients, protect patients, screen staff protect them, and provide leadership um, through lots of communication and education to our folks. Um, really, the basic steps were that 
as I mentioned, we made sure to screen all of our patients and staff, which was something that had really not been done, to my knowledge, in dialysis facilities prior to this. Um, issues around PPE, educating everybody, not only with uh, multiple patient letters, there have been multiple versions, as you might imagine, but really, um, initially, daily communications to both all of our staff as well as our medical staff is now a little less frequent. Um, and then to re-educate, as many of you know, there have been multiple iterations of what the appropriate PPE might be depending on what we know. And then um, to really provide guidelines with regards to how we care for our patients who may be COVID-19, what you've heard of as these P as PUI persons under investigation. And then once people were COVID-19 positive, how we would dialyze them in our facilities so we wouldn't put others at risk, but still could provide dialysis. And then, you know, we're starting to get to the backside of, us, of this. How do we take patients out of precautions? How do we feel that it's safe for them to come out? Um, and then how do we make sure that the entire environment is appropriate by expanding uh, what we would clean on surfaces? So the place is not only the chairs and the machines, but the items that we never thought of. Um, you know, the, the handles on, on wheelchairs, the knobs on the doors to the bathroom, the, the rails on the scales, and now we have checklists to do all of this. Um, and so with that, I want to hand this over to Liz to talk about what we're doing to screen our patients. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So this uh, evolved from the uh, beginning of March and the last um, uh, update, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, was March um, um, 25th. We were incredibly fortunate, it seems fortunate now, it didn't feel fortunate at the time, um, <laughs> to have a uh, national um, um, CDC team with us from essentially March 1st through March 14th. Um, they helped us uh, organize a contact line list of both patients and staff talk about how do we do a modified contact droplet within the outpatient dialysis? How do we teach our people to don and doff blue isolation gowns where we have not donned and doffed thinking about transmission um, 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 before this? So, so this is basically we screen every single patient and every single family member that comes in. We've tried to minimize all um, um, visitors, except for those people, you know, you have those patients that absolutely need to have their loved one with them in order for them to get through their run. And so we have made accommodations. So there, there does have to be some um, gray. If the patient screens positive for um, symptoms, new cough, fever, sore throat, new, short, short, shortness of breath. And new is really important because every MWF patient comes in on Monday and they're coughing. So is it really new or is it really odd for them? So that's what makes it really challenging um, um, with our uh, patients. So once they come in, we immediately put a mask on them. If, if, if they're positive, we try to get them right to the dialysis chair. We try to prioritize putting them in a private room, and then we take care of them using what we're calling modified contact droplet precautions. As we thought about conserving PPE early on in the days, we limited the gowning, donning and doffing to the on procedure, the off procedure, and the nurse assessment. Those were when we had hands-on patients and their chairs. Um, and then going in and out of the bubble, um, we did not. And again, this was worked on with the team that was here um, with us the first, um, the first couple weeks of March. Uh, if we don't have a private room available for a known positive patient, and that's that box that you see in the um, bottom center, then we escalate that to see if we can move the patient to a unit that has a private room. Again, as we're in this stabilization phase, thinking about um, um, future, we're not going to have enough private rooms per se. And so how do we safely take care of these folks? We found that as we moved patients around to put them in a private room, we lost something along the way. We lost a staff that knew that patient so well that a patient came to run in another place and the the person staff from their home base would never have put them on dialysis because they would have known critically thinking right away that that patient was very different. And so um, we've had to really think about where we want to run patients. Next slide, please. So then the question becomes, what do we do with the staff? And uh, this again was updated in the uh, middle of March. Um, so 
Early on, we actually furloughed staff that uh, took care of uh, a known COVID positive patient. We actually um, had our hospital services staff uh, take care of the first two deaths in the hospital. Um, and so we furloughed probably 10 of the hospital services staff and then in the outpatient clinic, another nine staff. And so, so we had probably almost 20 staff um, off of work. As everyone's aware that those uh, guidelines have uh, since changed, so we're doing daily symptom monitoring on all staff coming to work and that includes active temperature taking. And then they sign and then we have little stickers that I'm sure you all have as well. Um, so if they have um, any signs and symptoms, they're asked to stay home. If they come to work and they have any signs and symptoms, then we mask them and we um, send them home and then we try to get them into testing. So then of course you say, next slide please, well if you get your staff person tested, when can they come back to work? And um, this is probably the most challenging, changing, uh, piece of this whole uh, workforce. And so we landed on the CDC recommendations that um, if you had an employee that had an alternative diagnosis, say they had flu or they had strep, they could come back in our normal procedures, which is 24 hours without fever and their signs and symptoms are better. If they had a lab confirmed positive COVID test or signs and symptoms consistent with COVID-19 and they were tested. Again, back in the day, we had a harder time getting our folks tested than, than uh, we do now. Then they could come to work at least three days, 72 hours that have since passed since recovery, which the CDC has um, defined as resolution of fever without the use of NSAIDs um, and improvement in respiratory symptoms and at least seven days since they first had their signs and symptoms. Um, it seems like we've all sort of turned into uh, employee health nurses as well, so we've uh, learned a lot. Um, I think the question that we'll address um, later on is when do we allow patients back in the general um, um, population. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Suzanne, who's going to touch a little bit on how we've approached our home dialysis patients. Yeah, thanks Liz. And I mean, the amount of work that you and your team, that all of us have put into this is just extraordinary and so um, I'm sure everybody else can relate to that. And it is interesting, the philosophy that we put into how we're thinking about all of this, having our employees come back to work, for example, is really based on the best knowledge that we know. However, every dialysis organization seems to have a slightly different mm -hmm. version of this. So just because you're hearing this from us, don't feel like this is set in stone. There's still so much we need to know. And I think that's where I'm gonna segue into the home population. And really, you know, don't forget about your home patients. If you could switch to the next slide, that would be great. So what are the implications for home dialysis patients? Really think about it. These are patients that can stay home. How fabulous, right? Well, um, at least for us, we saw these patients very frequently. They, they like to come in, not 13 times per month, but certainly once or twice per month to have a little bit of interaction with um, staff that they know so well, sometimes better than their own family. Um, but we did recognize that it was important to see how we could stand up programs to allow our patients not to have to come into clinic and have less exposure to folks around, especially in our state ordered stay home, um, stay safe uh, program. So um, we stood up a processes both in for home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, to better adhere to social distancing. So with that, can you switch to the next slide? And for our home peritoneal dialysis patients, uh, we established quick visits. Uh, rather than come in for their very um, intensive visit with the full cohort of NKC staff, they would come in quickly to have blood work drawn, get supplies, and then go home if they had the capacity to have telehealth visits with our own staff. They would also get medication administration such as IV iron if they needed to. However, um, we are standing up as of this month the ability for our um, home dialysis facilities to have direct telehealth visits as many of you are out there as well with our patients through their devices. When they come in for that visit potentially to get their um, supplies and labs, we are checking their devices, asking them to bring them in so that we can help our own patients set things up. 
Um, for our home hemodialysis patients, however, those folks are not needing to come in if they um, have the capacity from a telehealth perspective to dial in. And so they're still sending their blood directly to the lab. Each of our home hemodialysis patients has a centrifuge that they use to spin their own blood down. Um, and then if we're able, we connect via telehealth either with or without um, an, a video component. Um, with that, I'm going to ask you to move over to the next slide. And I think it's important to recognize uh, not just for our home patients, but also for all of our patients, one of the real challenges that we've seen is the issue around rapid resource acquisition, both for patients and staff. So personal protective equipment, we've all um, recognized that it's been an issue and we've come up with creative solutions. So in addition to the 64,000 masks that we saw on our loading dock uh, last week, um, there was a time before the 65,000 masks showed up. And so we had to be creative. In addition to using masks for all of our staff, and when we didn't have them, we ordered bandanas. In fact, now I hear that we have masks that we're ordering um, that are not medical grade per se, but in addition to all the medical grade use, if we don't, if we end up running out, we're going to have NTC logos. So to make this something where it's part of everybody and so they know that our organization is doing the best we can to keep people safe. Um, and we also have had issues with hand sanitizer, just like all of you have had. Um, as we ran out, we recognized that we needed to source additional. So we found a local compounding group, and uh, they unfortunately did not have the isopropyl alcohol to create it. So we had to source 55 gallons of <laughs> isopropyl alcohol, which we had driven up from California, and we now call this our special reserve. Private label. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, and so with that, you can switch over to the next slide on the HOME program. Current state is that we're training with continued um, newly established infection control and prevention issues. Um, these increased home visits for deliveries, we know that some of the vendors are having issues with regards to bringing stuff in. So uh, for better or for worse, our staff are incredibly resourceful, some of them in assessing what patient needs are, having to help um, actually deliver. So that's something I think in our community still needs to be addressed. And with regards to remote care management, um, you know, larger units, we're doing our best to align with social distancing and encouraging clinic staff to work from home when possible, but we do have, um, you know, essential workers that need to be there, our nurses, our technicians, we feel our social workers and our dietitians are critical parts of the interdisciplinary team. Um, and so with that, I want to segue back to Liz to Ooh. talk about. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. This is indeed a quick and R, I can say, and we do speak quickly, normally, uh, so if you can go to our, um, uh, last, our uh, next slide, please. So as we move into what is future state going to be like post-COVID, um, I will say, honestly, I'm not sure there's going to be post-COVID. Um, I think uh, this is a, what uh, began as a sprint, became a marathon, and it feels like there's actually no finish line. So, so I think we have to adapt. Um, I think that there's a uh, Several things that we will absolutely continue that I think are actually better patient care. So we will continue screening and transmission-based um, modified droplet contact. I think this is the new normal, um, and I think this is appropriate, and I'm actually excited to see what impact we have on the upcoming flu season. Um, this is going to uh, require us to keep our staff educated around the um, use of um, of um, PPE and actually we'll, we will have to source more PPE. Uh, enhanced environmental cleaning, Dr. Wannick, um spoke to that. Again, I think patients feel safe right now. They said this is the cleanest the place has ever been. So I think that is um, a great enhancement. Um, you know, telehealth, I think this will be the wave of the future and we have to get really facile with how to actually do that in a way that makes sense for both our patients and our physicians. Uh, next slide, please. The psychosocial impact, you know, this is an unknown. I think this will be extensive and we don't know what it looks like, but the psychological impact on all of our caregivers has been profound. Uh, I think we need to ensure that we um, provide support, training for our staff, um, you know, it's not easy sometimes to take care of our long-term um, patients day in, um, 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 day out, and I think that we've all had that staff fear of, you know, I actually signed up for this, but I didn't sign my family up for this. 
Um, so I think that is uh, definitely a body of work. Um, and integrated care models will be absolutely emphasized. I think we've seen that we need to be able to do better handoffs. Even within our own facilities, we have to do better handoffs. Um, so, I, so I think those are the key pieces of what we need to think about that might be the golden egg, if you will, or the golden ticket, <laughs> right, um, to this uh, challenging pandemic. Uh, and then our last slide, please. So as we finish up, just want to emphasize these three guiding principles that Liz and I have really relied on very heavily as we try to think about new recommendations, the next steps as we move through the stabilization phase and try to move towards um, the, the back end of where are we going with post-COVID. You know, we can provide dialysis to COVID-19 patients. We have an obligation to do this. We're following the science and really leaning into infection prevention control like we never have before. So we can provide our, the highest standards of care for our patients and for our staff, and really leadership is critical. I think it's been a really nice illustration for everybody. Liz and I have worked very hard mm -hmm. to make sure that um, our dyad partnership is strong. Um, we have plenty of bumps along the way. I know I do. Um, I do as well. <laughs> <laughs> but she and I have worked really hard to make sure that we're messaging out to all of our staff, including medical staff, and making sure our patients are aware that um, we're trying the best we can to communicate transparently, provide them assurances, and communicate on a regular basis so we can pr provide support for patients um, and then the dialysis and medical staff. And so with that, thank you so much for your attention. I know Liz and I really are looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you both. And we've got about three minutes for questions, and I've got three questions. So what do you think about a quick lightning round for questions if we, if we can? Sure, go ahead. Fire All right. away. First question, uh, when patients, uh, when you had patient people in with patients for treatments, did you ask if there was a family member or person in their home that was sick or had been tested, or was that a question that you added later on? That was a question that we added later on, absolutely, because that is where we're seeing transmission happen even right now. Yep. Great, great. Next. Um, our next question, uh, and this is a comment and a question. Um, they say they ran into their first uh, person under an investigation a couple weeks ago and opened up a fourth shift just for that patient. Uh, has anyone else managed this by opening a fourth or an extra shift, um, especially in those clinics where patients cannot be placed six feet apart uh, because of chair location, et cetera? Every dialysis organization is going to have their own personal way of dealing with this. We're trying the best we can to share practices with the community. I can tell, I can assure you there have been multiple calls every week for the past eight weeks about this. So, yes, there are some dialysis organizations that have not only opened up extra shifts, but have actually stood up facilities um, where they're putting specific COVID-19 patients. So we, to the best of our knowledge, um, really feel that it's worked well to have the patients dialyzing in private rooms in their home environment where the staff knows them well and where the patient feels comfortable. There's no place like home, in our opinion, but we know that other folks um, are doing it the best of their abilities, and it may include a separate shift yep. or a separate uh, facility. Yep. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, another question that came in. Um, they, I guess they thought what was said was the return to work criteria was three days without fever, with, uh, without NSAIDs. Is that correct? Or was it without fever reducing medications uh, like Tylenol as well? Without any medications and at least seven days. So if you got better within three days, you still come, cannot come back for a full seven days. Seven full days. Very good. Thank you yeah. for clarifying that. I, I actually got yeah. one or two questions yeah. on that. Um, another question that came in, um, do you cohort asymptomatic or exposed uh, persons under investigation differently than symptomatic PUIs? Can you say that question again? Do we cohort uh, asymptomatic eight? positive patients? Do you mean the same... Or, or just people, uh, persons under investigation differently than those who are actually showing symptoms? So for us, when we, if we have somebody who's COVID-19 positive, that person will dialyze in a private room. At, at this point, that is what we do. When we have persons under investigation, the only way that they would be persons under investigation but not known COVID-19 positive would be because mm -hmm. they have symptoms. And if they have symptoms but we don't know that they're COVID-19 positive, 
we would use the, all of the precautions that we had listed there where the patient has a mask and the staff are using modified contact droplet precautions as appropriate. Very good. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate that. Uh, one more question that came in, um, and, and we just got this one in last minute here. Where in the outpatient facility do peritoneal dialysis patients that are COVID plus uh, positive receive care if a face-to-face -face visit is needed, such as with uh, peritonitis, et cetera? So um, many of our um, outpatient um, 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 clinics have a separate home suite, and so the home patients have, have actually separate rooms, exam rooms, separate from the outpatient in-center dialysis chairs. So they and would come so that's in. where they would come, yeah. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, and I think we can get one more in here. Um, <laughs> Uh, they're coming in fast and furious. So I, pre I appreciate your uh, <laughs> rapid responses here. Um, do, does your staff um, do your, does your staff dialyze COVID nineteen patients using N ninety five masks? No. <laughs> so, so that's um, you know God bless the N ninety five in the media. So. Um, we, again, we really leaned into our um, very seasoned infectious disease colleagues that we have in the city. We worked with the CDC. We followed the World Health Organization guidelines. Um, so we have never used N95. So if you go into one of our hospitals in this area, and if you're an acute care patient, you will see your staff in a surgical face mask and eye protection. And that is what we use in the outpatient clinic. We felt early on and we still feel now that we need to preserve those N95 respirators for the staff taking care of patients undergoing highly aerosolized generating procedures, intubation, tracheal suctioning, things like that. And we know that many dialysis organizations are, are not following that. Mm -hmm. However, this is what we're doing because we're doing the best we can to follow mm -hmm. that science as best we know right now. So we recognize that everyone's doing this differently, but you yeah. heard us unanimously reply to that question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we did. <laughs> um, Suzanne and Liz, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're just about at the end of our time. In fact, we're a minute over. So uh, I do want to say thank you again for joining us and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you so much. All right. Bye -bye. Our, pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who are, are still connected here, uh, I want to uh, wrap up today with a few announcements. Uh, we are putting these dates out here to save the dates for our next events. Uh, we will have our patient-focused event on April 28th. That is a Tuesday evening at 5 p.m. Eastern. And our next provider-focused event will be Wednesday evening. That's April 29th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Now, these events are rapidly evolving, and, and we're uh, scheduling new ones all the time. So if you visit www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com, you can see that on your screen, uh, you can find all of the information for these sessions and information on how to register as well. That's www.kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Uh, and that will take us to our last slide. Thank you so much. Our contact information is on the screen here, as well as uh, links to resources from the Kidney Community Emergency Response Program and the CDC. I would encourage you to go visit those if you uh, feel so inclined. Uh, but we do want to say thank you for your time today. Thank you for your patience as we got started. And we hope that we see you on our next uh, COVID-19 Quickenar. Thanks so much, and have a great evening. <laughs>